is airlifted out of fire-ravaged Malakuta, as well as their families who've waited in fear for days. All they wanted was to hold each other close. When we realised we couldn't get out, when we, uh, well, probably just before we took to our boat and went onto the river, with my daughter who was pregnant and her three-year-old, and my son and his girlfriend, we went out onto the river and that's where it went completely black. Michelle and Fred Dykeman spent 36 hours sheltering on a fishing boat from the fire that hit Malakuta. We are running out of food really and it was getting really cold. Even on the water, they were in danger. The scariest thing for me was the, um, the grumbling thunder and the wind. The, the thunder it was just like rumbling all the time around us. Um, and then we, were told, we, we got a message from someone to say, um, you need to move closer to the land because the lightning started to strike everywhere. After they came ashore, they had to fight to save their house. Spent a couple of hours putting out spot fires, trying to save the, the boardwalk, our favourite walk in Malakuta. It didn't work, of course. The CFA firefighters helped save their home when the fire came into the backyard. I believe one of the guys that um, saved our house lost his, um, which is a sad story. Um, yeah, so it's just been, been fairly stressful. Hi hey everyone, Ben Pettingill here. I'm in Malakuta. Ben Pettingill and his family also found themselves stranded in Malakuta. It's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. It is hectic here. Definitely not what we had in mind for our holiday, but we're just watering sites down, watering tents, watering cars, watering assets. And we've got family down near the boats ready to go in case this fire does getting closer. As the sky went black, he took shelter with six others on a five metre fishing boat. We all jumped in the boats. We had to have masks on, towels wrapped around our heads, sunglasses on. We went about 500 metres offshore. The wind was blowing, embers were coming past our boat. And we sat there for three hours, basically in silence, and just had the ABC radio on in the boat. A lot of houses had unfortunately been lost and we continued to watch them burn around the side of the lake for the rest of the afternoon, just one after the other. So it was very scary listening to gas bottles exploding. Because he is blind, Ben Pettingill couldn't be part of the naval evacuation days earlier. Unfortunately because I can't see, I wasn't able to go by boat. But he's now been evacuated on board one of the Army's helicopters. All of a sudden a Navy helicopter pulled up, said we need 12 people and we're going now. Within two minutes we had goggles on, we had helmet on, we'd had a briefing and we were on the plane, uh, on the helicopter coming to sail. And Ben Pettingill has a very good reason for needing to leave town. Dad said the roads may be closed for up to seven or eight weeks and I'm getting married in seven so I thought I'd better get out of there. It's been an agonising wait for many, including Matt George. Yeah. Is, it, is, is yeah. that him? Yeah. I just want to see my boy and see my wife. Yeah, I just want to get him home. I know a lot of other people are in worse situations than what we are. Um, but yeah, I just want to, want to see him and just give him a big hug. Seven-year-old son Jet and wife Claire were visiting family in Malakuta for Christmas. Low on fuel and with diesel reserved for firefighting vehicles, they were unable to get out before it became too dangerous to leave. I was afraid that my wife and my young son were, were gone and her parents were, were gone as well. I just thought the worst. <laughs> The Army operation out of the East Sail Air Base went all day and well into the night. Bus by bus, evacuees arrived at the town's sports complex for some food and a hot shower. As well as the official fire relief efforts, 
The local community has sprung into action to help the hundreds of people taking shelter in the Gippsland town of Sale. We'll bring the camping gear in tomorrow. Yep, awesome. That would be brilliant. Cool. On the main street, one cafe has been converted into a drop-off centre for donations. It doesn't look like them at the moment, but we're getting there. I think I've got a couple of um, face washes and stuff. But that's... Kerry Grattan says over the past 48 hours, people have driven up to 300 kilometres to drop off supplies. A lot of people are very reserved. You know, they, they don't want the help. They, they just need the basics and, and they're out of here. You know, they're, they're not asking for anything major. They just need a bit of water. So we're sort of having to encourage them to, to take more, you know. This, this, all of this here is for them. These people have lost everything, um, or a lot of them, or have had to get out of where they are because the possibility of them losing everything is huge. A lifelong Gippslander, Kerry Grattan says she's never seen anything like it. It says so much, like Sale has just pulled together. They just want to do everything they can to help, to make sure that everybody has exactly what they need and nobody's going without. Double bed, mattresses, yeah. Um, Sally picked, of course, a uh, sort of spare bedroom, a double couch. Local real estate agent Leo O'Brien is matching up Gippsland residents offering up their homes with people who fled from the bushfires and need a place to stay. I think we got up to probably enough accommodation to, to house 500 people, you know. Um, and we've probably housed close to 200 in a couple of days. We were looking after the people that were arriving here with virtually nowhere to stay and nothing, nothing to stay in. As the fire weather eases off over the next few days, some evacuees are choosing to return home. But there are hundreds more who no longer have a home to return to. They've got people who have lost their homes and they may need somewhere to stay for weeks or months until they've sorted out what they're doing. And the next phase of it is I've got a lot of people who've offered, you know, granny flats, um, self-contained units that that's no one's living in. And it's not over yet. Amid the scenes of human heartache this summer, another tragedy has been playing out, the huge toll on our unique wildlife. With repeated fires, it's likely that there will be long-term decreases in their populations to the point where even currently common species begin to come under real threat for, uh, for their existence. We can warm the milk. Now we go feed. It's just skin and bone, this little fella. It's just a yeah, little tiny little thing. Like thousands of other Australians, these kangaroo joeys are bushfire refugees. Mm, Baba, going to sleep. Susie Pulis runs a wildlife shelter in East Gippsland. As the fire front bore down, she fled with more than 30 native animals she was looking after. There's no sign of life, there's no sign of the, the dead animals. They're, they're just burnt beyond, you know, they're burnt to ash. If I hadn't evacuated the animals at the shower, they could have definitely been under threat. So the toll on me is huge. I, sorry, hold it a minute. Susie's been caring for these four joeys in the lounge room of a friend's house at nearby Raymond Island. It's a disaster what has happened, but the community has come together and really wanting to help, and it's just, just awesome to see that. Yeah, so I just want to say a big thank you. Elsewhere on the island, Susie has enlisted a group of volunteers to collect food for seven koalas that she's temporarily housed in a backyard. We've got a roster going at the moment, and um, every morning, we come and put new food in for the koalas. 
and make sure it's all clean and nice for them and that they're all happy. They're here uh, because they were terribly sick, starving basically, but through the, the care and the good work of the locals on Raymond Island, um, we've been able to bring them back to good health. Koalas are particularly vulnerable to the bushfire threat. One of their responses to a threat is to climb up to the top of a tree and sit there. And if you have crown fires happening, that's obviously the last place you want to be. Ecologist Chris Dickman says that other animals not directly threatened by the flames could also face a grim future. They may be able to go underground, they might be able to go down into a deep burrow, um, cracks in the soil or find um, even crevices in, in rocks if they're in rocky country. For them the problem of the fires is going to be that when they re-emerge after the flames have passed there'll be very little food, very little water, very little shelter, all their habitat would have gone. So these include species like the, uh, the long-footed potteroo that occurs in Gippsland, East Gippsland. Professor Dickman sparked international headlines with his estimate that up to a billion native animals have been affected by these fires. Using average density estimates from published information in New South Wales, it looks as if around 800 million uh, mammals, birds and reptiles have been affected by the fires. If we can make the assumption that the average densities calculated for New South Wales can be extrapolated into Victoria, where uh, 1.2 million hectares have, uh, have burned, then we're probably looking at a billion mammals, birds and reptiles that have been affected by the fires. So it's, numbers are huge. One of our guys was escorted through the fires and he said it was like walking through a crematorium. He said it was deathly quiet, there was no birds, there was just charred bodies. Jenny Packwood has been caring for injured birds at her home in Vincentia on the New South Wales south coast. Birds with singed feathers, burnt feet, sea eagle I had last week, came in with badly burnt feet. We have a little baby, little baby wattle bird. Obviously there's not enough food out there, again, because of the drought and the fire situation. Dead grass, no leaves, no fruit on trees. Down the road, another volunteer, Shirley Lack, is taking care of wombats orphaned by the fires. Come on, Ash. Come on. Come on, get a bit warm outside for you. Wombats are um, a lucky animal. They don't have a lot of impact as the fire's going over, but it's when they come out after the fire that the ground's all burnt and there's no food. The mother goes onto the side of the road um, looking for food and they're hit and then the babies are left in the, in the burrow at, at this stage and nobody comes back to get them and then after a couple of days the baby goes looking for mum. Sadly, a number of our native animals may now face an uncertain future. It'll never recover in my lifetime, never. Be lucky to recover in my grandkids' lifetime. Sorry. I think it is quite possible that there will be some species that face imminent extinction as a consequence of these fires. And I guess we'll, we'll only better find out what the effects of the fires have been when we get the chance to get back in and, and look at uh, whether there are survivors. This pile of charred, twisted metal and ash is all that remains of Cat Hammond's family home. It was wiped out by a fire she never believed would take their house. I thought, my house is made of bricks and we don't have any big trees around it. And we'd been in drought for three years. I thought, there's virtually no fuel in the paddocks. We have no grass. The fire had been burning in nearby East Gippsland for weeks but as weather conditions worsened, it crept closer. We knew it was burning weeks before. There'd been lots of discussion about what we would do. And when I say discussion, it's largely argument between Adrian and myself because he wanted to stay and defend and I wanted to take the animals and go. But on Friday afternoon, some really knowledgeable horse people and great people 
rang me and said, get your horses out. They evacuated with their pets on Sunday evening. We prepared notes to put on the fence so that we didn't want anybody risking their lives to save our house. So we just let the fireys know. We just put no animals, no pets. Told them where there was water down in the bottom paddock. So what, what do you now know happened after you evacuated? It initially came up, they told me, from the bottom right-hand corner of our property, which is on 50 acres, it came roaring up the hill. When did you find out you'd lost your home? I got a phone call from Troy, our next-door neighbour. He said, Kat, I don't know how to tell you this, and it's a horrible call. He said, but um, I think both yours and my houses have burnt down. My house is flattened. Adrian's shed, every tool in his shed doesn't exist anymore. And you get there and everything is black except for a blue, untouched wading pool with a highly flammable nylon canopy over it and one of the go-karts, a little blue Mario Brothers looking go-kart sits beside the pool in this landscape of black. Yesterday was Kat and Adrian's son's wedding. They and the wedding flowers couldn't get there as the fire flared back up again. My oldest son, it's his Australian wedding. They, they got married in London a couple of months ago and this wedding was for all of his Australian family and friends to go to in La Cola. I mean, he's, they fully understand that we couldn't go, but yeah, so. How does it feel missing that though? Yeah, that was pretty awful. The Hammonds say they will stay in East Gippsland and rebuild on their property. But for now, all they have are their animals and a few personal effects. I've got a little suitcase with some semi-formal stuff in it. I've got a bigger case that I grabbed because my sister insisted that I wasn't prepared enough and I threw some clothes in. So I, almost like a bratty child, I grabbed five shirts off my wardrobe and wrapped them up and shoved them in and a pair of jeans and I thought I'd better get Adrian something too. And so I threw a few of his things in, a pair, one pair of jeans and two shirts, socks and jocks. And that's it in that. Oh, and I put in um, some letters that my son had written me and... Cat knows this fire emergency is far from over and he's warning other Australians to stay alert. You get complacent and you go, oh yeah, the fire's in the background, we better watch that. It, it might flare up, but you don't really think it's going to flare up. Victorians are banding together to support the many families who have lost everything or been forced from their homes. Manpreet Singh and a couple of mates from Melbourne heard about the emergency and drove straight to the Bairnsdale Evacuation Centre where they've been cooking and serving free meals. They are beautiful people and they are uh, appreciating our efforts and uh, they give me so much love. Local chef Susan Peterson lost two homes as fire swept through Sarsfield two days ago. Mum and Dad have a, a house in the front of my property and then my house is behind it, so they're about oh, 100 metres apart. They moved up here when Dad got crook, so it's more like a dependent relative sort of setup. They had their own house and their own shed and their own space. What's left now? Not a great deal. She reluctantly evacuated with her family on Monday. Early Tuesday morning, I was sitting having a coffee with Rye and he got a phone call and said someone, and you just, you see it on his face and I'm like, what, what, what? and somebody had driven to our place and started taking photos and it was gone. Everything was gone, melted, gone, like a bomb had gone off. Unlike many in this region, Susan was fully insured, but some treasured items will never be replaced. I had people, my girlfriends ringing me, crying because they can't come and have a cup of tea at my house. It had so many memories, so many events over all these years. Will you rebuild? Yeah, yeah, I like it there. <laughs> I shouldn't, but I do. It's hard. We're going up to see if my house is still standing and see if my horses are still alive.
But anyway, it's gone now. I don't know what we're supposed to do next. No. I just don't know. No. You want to stay here? Yep. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. No, I'll rebuild again. Actually, we shouldn't really be here because another tree might fall on us if it's burning. Hey. Yep. It should go up. Good so. I mean, my heart's totally broken. But you just got to go on. Simple as that, eh? I suppose it's not that simple, but and it won't be that simple. But we'll do it, and everybody else will. And we've got a great community. We'll all help each other. What was in this shed here? Probably $30,000 worth of hay. I mean, you've got hungry cows right now. Yeah, they're starving actually now. Yeah. Well, we've just got a, we've got a, a dozen bales of silage left, that's all we've got. Um, feed in the silos here, but no power to get it out. How do you, you, you pick yourself up today? You, you've got it. You've just got it. Well, up until 24 hours ago, this was the beautiful town of Cabago on the New South Wales south coast. It had gorgeous shops here, very historic town, and the commercial heart of this town had literally been ripped out. And the most devastating of all, Two people in the district were killed. All this can be rebuilt. <laughs> you know, it can be replaced, but we can't replace those amazing two men that we lost that were defending their property. They are amazing. No one will understand till they've been in it. That wall of fire that came over here, and we stayed and defended our home till that. We heard that wall of fire and People say it's like a steam train. It is. It is roaring. And we're just all evacuated to the showground. We were able to get resources here fairly quickly and start to save some of the other infrastructure from the post office up. But these shops, I'm afraid, were totally involved, engulfed, and within half an hour, as you see it now, it was all very quick. And this is the heart of the town, isn't this it? This is the heart of the town, yes. So we've lost some very long established businesses. Uh, their livelihoods are gone and it's, it's, a, it's a devastating blow to a little country village, but we will survive. It's shattering to see the main street, you know, like um, it, this, this is such a great little town and we've loved living here. Anybody else? Yeah, it's pretty crap. <laughs> yeah, I feel for everyone. Bread, butter, bread there. Yeah. I feel for everyone in the town. Pretty shit. <laughs> this is Cabago Showground, and it's become a refuge, in effect, for the fire refugees. Almost everyone here has lost their home. And if they don't know yet, they fear they've lost it. And of course, all their possessions, and for some people also, their animals. <laughs> You're <a> star, Mac. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were nice little goats. So yeah, we had, uh, we had um, um, two mums and their babies, and um, they had a buck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of family pets, I guess. But uh, yeah, we can start again. Hopefully, the insurance is up to date. That's always the thought at the moment. Came up pretty quick on this side. A lot of, lot of fuel in there. I 
That's the house. <laughs> it wasn't the most beautiful house in the world, but we were going to do something with it. Yeah, so this was the project. Um, and yeah, I guess it's a bigger project now. Oh, here's the goats. Come here, goats. Come here. Come on. Yeah, it's um, it's a difficult, going to be a difficult time. But I think if anywhere can do it and anywhere can pull through, then from what I've seen, Cabago can do it. Batlow resident Max Gordon Hall rushed back from an overseas holiday to see if his home is still standing. I won't know until I get to that dirt patch at the end of the road. Oh, sugar. Holy mackerel. All that work for nothing. <sighs> Go down and have a look. Still smouldering. Gone. Absolutely sucks. The shed gone. Paramedic fell in love with Batlow nearly three years ago, buying his first home in a quiet street next to the state forest. So it was pretty much a three bedroom house. I just moved here maybe six months ago and I was doing up this house um, while I was renting and working at the same time. But it's the time that you put into it and the effort that you put in and then you, yeah. one night, gone. <laughs> it's gonna be stupid, but it's pride and joy. <laughs> Beautiful ride on Mars. <laughs> All the hay's gone. We just topped up the hay shed too. Batlow is now like a ghost town. There's no children playing, the streets are all empty, and all the shops are closed. Everywhere you look, there's this thick, eerie smoke that blankets the town. Time to get back into town. Former Batlow resident, Jay Twemlow, initially came back to assist his grandparents, but he also ended up helping save the town. I saved seven houses, and then two other local boys started at the other end and we just worked towards each other, putting out sheds and fences and trying to keep a containment line between, you know, grass fires in the backyard to the house. It was basically just following where I could see flames, you know, things popping up. You do this when there's black sky and flames and just basically driving through hell. Go! It's there! I'm out of here. Another property I'd done the shed on. Did my best, it didn't get to the house. Another local gentleman had saved, saved this house. Uh, the fires came down and there was actually logs on fire rolling down the hill towards the house. And um, he was left to deal with that. Did a brilliant job. As I made my way back around the other side, just where the brick carport is, there was an elderly lady and her brother sitting out in the backyard, and um, they said they were going to bunker down in a cellar just across the road. And like it's, the fires had roared 
all the way down through here, taking out a shed, and it was just, get out, you're not safe. It's so good to see you. How'd you go yesterday? As soon as the fire, the flame, we saw the flames across the road, yep. we went. I'm we, so we, glad we you got out. I was worried, I was worried. Sorry guys, it's happening. I'm sure you can hear the planes, there's planes going over, water bombing and helicopters. So just keep praying, just keep praying. While the battle for Bablo has had devastating consequences for Max, there's no way he's leaving his beloved town. That was a garbage bin. And that's just the most phenomenal town you could imagine. It's just a yeah, slice of heaven. I know that's cliche, but that's what it is. I think a lot of the people that have lost their houses will rebuild. I think it will survive. Um, you know, there's been fires not as bad as this around the area many years ago, and it's still standing.